uh, today from the book of 1 Timothy. We're going to the book of 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. And it says, And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me. Thank you, Jesus. Because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in, in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has enabled me. That ought to stir something up to you, with you on the inside. If it doesn't today, we'd like to use for our thought motivational grace. The kind of grace that makes you want to move and do something. In Bible study this week, we were having a conversation. We had a very candid conversation this week, a very candid discussion about the future of the church. We talked about the state of our church, Mount Gilead Baptist Church, and how we've been doing since COVID-19 hit and how cases are going up and not down and what that means to us right now. I shared that I made the decision not to enter back into the sanctuary quite yet because safety is my top concern and I don't want to flirt with the idea that we are somehow exempt from catching this potentially deadly disease. But I also shared with them a, a very sobering observation that even though we would one day be back in the sanctuary, church will never be the same as we know it. Church as we know it would never be the same again. We didn't create this situation, but church as we know it would never be the same again. We didn't ask for this, but church as we know it will never be the same again. We didn't see it coming, but church as we know it will never be the same again. We've been thrust into a new era of church life, and church will never be the same again. But because of this unanticipated, unprecedented, and unimaginable set of circumstances, we have new capabilities that allow us to engage with both the saved and the unsaved like we never have before. Where we were once just a, a little church in downtown Fort Worth, we now have the potential and the ability to share the gospel like we never have before. We have the potential to share the gospel across this city, across this state, across this nation, across the world. But the challenge that I submitted to the church, with the evolution of church as we know it, how are we going to rise together to fulfill the calling of Christ? How will we transition what we did in the building to what we do now outside of a building. How will we use the gifts of good works that Jesus Christ has given each and every one of us to share the good news of the gospel? But the real question today is, it's not how are we going to use our gifts, but what is going to motivate us to press forward. In this text, Paul is writing to a young man named Timothy who has taken on the role of pastoring and leading the church at Ephesus. Paul has a few miles under his belt now. He's been doing this thing for a while, but now he's passing on the wisdom. He's passing on the torch of ministry to a young man named Timothy. In his opening remarks, he sets the tone by giving a motivational speech. Now, I'm sure all of you have heard a motivational speech once or twice in your lifetime. Motivational speeches are timed and designed to pump you up. 
to get you going, to push you forward, to energize the atmosphere. We've heard them at graduations and at business meetings and at political rallies. And if you're an athlete, then I'm sure that you've heard a, a motivational talk before the game, after the game, and during the halftime. You know what I'm talking about. You've been sitting in the locker room and the coach comes in and he comes in and he says, team, give it all you've got. Lay it all out there on the table or you come in at halftime and he comes in and says, now we've done a good job or, or we may be falling behind, but you need to finish strong, finish strong, finish strong. You know the kind of motivational speeches that I'm talking about on today. Give me a like or give me a love right now if you've ever sat in, in some motivational speeches. Paul is giving a motivational speech. He's pumping up young Timothy at this time, but he gives a different kind of motivational speech. He doesn't share how Timothy should motivate himself. He shares indirectly what keeps him motivated. Let me say that one more time. He doesn't directly tell Timothy how to motivate himself, but he shares how he keeps himself. Paul keeps himself motivated. Paul keeps himself motivated the first way we look at verse 12, it says, And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, our Lord, who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. All Paul is trying to say right there is that Paul is admitting that his gratefulness keeps him going. If you're taking notes right now, your gratefulness should keep you going. Paul stands grateful that God has enabled him through his faithfulness. We have to remember that in Acts chapter 9 that it was Saul who was on a Damascus road and had a transformational encounter with Jesus Christ that converted him by faith into Paul. And in verse 20 of that same chapter, he was so moved by this meeting with the master that he immediately began to preach Christ in the synagogue. That's what the Bible says. He didn't wait to go to seminary. He didn't have to go through training. He didn't wait until he got comfortable, until he felt like it. He didn't wait for his life to get right. No, he decided right then and there when he made the conversion by faith to Jesus Christ that he must preach. It was not a choice for him. He didn't wait to decide. He said, I must preach right now. He says, Jesus counted me faithful, putting me in the ministry. Jesus showed up one day on a Damascus road, and from that moment on, Paul showed himself faithful, and he hired him on the spot. It was on that Damascus road that Paul didn't know anything about Jesus Christ, except I must persecute Christians, but Jesus met him on that road, and Jesus looked at him and says, I'm hiring you on the spot. And that ought to hit you between the eyes this morning. Because of your faith in Christ, he hired you on the spot. Ephesians 2 and 10 says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should what? walk in them. God has given you a purpose to do good works. Matter of fact, the best work that you can do is in the name of Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter what your job is. You can be CEO, CFO, whatever that is. But the best work that you can do is what's done in the name of Jesus Christ. So don't complain when Jesus hires you on the spot. If he hired you. To teach, then go teach. If he hired you to sing, if he hired you to play an instrument, if he hired you to dance in his name, if he hired you to serve in the usher board on his name, if he hired you to be a deacon, serve in his name. If you have skills on the computer, do it in his name. Because you have skills in AV, he hired you for that job. If he hired you to protect and secure, if he hired you to preach the gospel, then by faith, he will enable you to do good works. I'm just telling you what the word says. By faith, faith will motivate you 
to say, I must teach. Faith will motivate you to say, I must sing. Faith will motivate you to say, I must play my instrument. Faith will motivate you to say, I must dance in the name of Jesus Christ. Faith will motivate you to serve on the usher board and give it your best. Faith will motivate you to serve on the deacon board and keep you going strong. Faith will serve you because you have skills on that computer screen. Faith will motivate you because you have skills in AV. Faith will motivate you because you have the ability to protect and to secure. And no matter what the circumstances, by faith, I must preach the gospel. I'm just talking for my little old self right now. I must preach the gospel. It is so compelling deep down inside because my faith keeps me pressing forward. I'm going I'm to get done today. I'm going to get done. I'm not going to hold you long today. Paul immerses himself in his service. He jumps right in, head first, feet flat on the ground, and just goes right in and starts preaching. He didn't have the experience. He didn't have the qualifications, but he just goes right in. He didn't sit down on his salvation. His faith was ready on day one. He did not waste time because he was grateful. And that's what motivated him to keep going. But see, some of us have not learned to be grateful to be selected for service by the Savior. Oh, I'm, I'm, I might lose a few people in here today. Listen, let's face it. Some of us are not even grateful to be selected in our secular services. Oh, Reverend. Listen, I'm not going to be stepping on your toes very long. Just follow me here and watch this. A job. The job that you have, the job is your nine to five. Your job gets you money and you get to work. And if there happens to be another job that happens to pay a little more, then you know how it is. Sometimes it's just pennies more for what you're making, but it's on to the next one. You're not invested. You're not invested into the, the job that you have because it's just about a means to an end, you despise getting out of bed and you look forward to getting off every day. But a career is a lifelong commitment. See, even after retirement, you don't lose the passion that you have for a career. You don't lose the know-how, the skill, the ability, the motivation to do what you do as a career. And you don't mind passing on your knowledge and your wisdom when you have a career is something that you can't wait to get out of bed for. It's something that gives you purpose and drive and resolve. And it's not something that you look at the clock and go hour by hour, but it's something that keeps you up and moving and motivated 24 hours a day, seven days a week. A career will keep you motivated. It gives you purpose. It gives you loyalty to stay in a career that you really believe in. See, Paul had a job before. Let me say that one more time. Saul had a job, but Paul had a career in Christ. But not only was it his gratitude that kept him going in his career, it was his gullibility that kept him going. His gullibility. Oh, y'all gonna, gonna catch it here in a second. Look at verse 13. It says, although... I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man. But I obtained mercy because I did it, what? Ignorantly, in unbelief. Paul makes this transition, and he's showing us that he was ignorant. He was gullible before in what he did. Paul had enough sense to wake up and realize that what he was doing was all wrong. Not only was he doing it wrong, but Saul was the worst of the worst. He was so bad that he spoke against everything that Jesus Christ stood for and tried to convince others to do the same. See, Saul was a Pharisee. Saul thought that he knew better and he did not believe that Jesus was Christ and could not understand why other people were flocking to this man. 
didn't see the purpose behind the man that had died on the cross and he was dead and gone, the people, for some reason, still chose to be followers and disciples of Jesus Christ. He punished and prosecuted others and persecuted them and took pleasure in doing so. His job was to deal devastation to disciples. That was his job. But he didn't know how good it could be to have a career in Christ. Oh, I'm about to bless you today. He says he did it ignorantly in what? Unbelief. Here's a word for you on today. Buckle your seatbelt. The reason that his gullibility motivates him to keep going is because he knows he was not qualified to have a career in Christ. His gullibility keeps him going because he knew that he was not qualified for a career in Christ. He came to realize that he did not deserve it, but the Lord granted it to him in spite of his gullibility, in spite of what he says, his ignorance. Paul says, I was too bad of a person to have something so good given to me. Paul says, I was unqualified to have this career in Christ. The most interesting thing is, is that in his ignorance, he thought that what he was doing wrong was actually the right thing to do. That's what made Paul so gullible, so ignorant to what he was supposed to be doing. And some of us are so gullible, I'm going to help you here, as to believe that what we have been doing, that we've been on the right path, but we've been doing it wrong all this time. See, some of us think we all have it, we have it all figured out. We think that our time, our task, our labor, everything we've been doing has been the right thing to do. But if it's not done in the name of Jesus Christ, then we may be on the wrong path. Some of us look at service, our task, our labor, and and it all looks so time consuming. It all looks like a waste of resources. But I want to encourage somebody out there today who may be ignorant in their unbelief. Just have a little faith in Jesus Christ and you will understand why service is an undeserved privilege that we are all unqualified for. But he gives us the gift of grace and salvation. It's an undeserved gift. Okay, and let me go here. Y'all may not let me be pastor after this one. Some of us have overcome our gullibility. We are not ignorant because we are believers. But some of us are not motivated to keep going. Oh, let me be plain with this. Some of us are baptized, born again believers. But we are sitting on our salvation. You think you got your salvation because you were so good and you were good enough to receive it. I'm going to help you in here today. Paul reminds us that you did not get your salvation because you were so good. You got it because he was so good for you and you were so bad. That's hard for us to hear sometimes. But we did not receive salvation. We didn't Get it because we asked for it. We weren't so good to ask for it. We got it because he was so good. I'm talking about Jesus Christ. And he loved us so much to give it to us because we didn't deserve it. We were, we were bad off. Don't let the devil feed you the lie that you were so good that you chose Christ. No, because you were so bad that you should have been disqualified, but Christ chose you anyway. In spite of yourself, Christ chose you. For sins that you didn't even know that you committed, Christ chose you. Even when you complained about it, Christ chose you. Even in your ignorance, Christ chose you. Even when you were down and everybody wrote you off, Christ chose you. Christ chose you. 
You didn't choose him. He chose to get up on that cross. And he looked down into that cup before he got up there. And he saw you and me and all of our faces. And he chose to get on that cross to give you the gift of salvation. The choice that we make is the choice to follow him. But make no mistake about it, Christ loved you so much that he chose to die on that cross for you. Church, as, the, as we continue to evolve through the circumstances of COVID-19, we have to ask ourselves this question. Are we faithful to the church or are we faithful to Christ? Are we faithful to the building that we met in for Bible study and for service, for choir rehearsal and for church cleanups and different things? Or are we faithful to the calling of Jesus Christ? See, we're in some strange times right now where our church is now in a living room. So you have to ask yourself the question, what's going to keep you motivated to stay committed to the call of Jesus Christ? Will your faith motivate you to say, I must serve instead of I'll serve him when I get back into a building? Truth be told, we don't know what tomorrow holds for us. We may not ever go back into a building, but will you say to yourself, I must serve in the name of Jesus Christ? Many of us have been enabled because of our faith in Jesus. And Christ hired us for a career to carry his name forward. But some of us, where we were sprinting, now we've become stagnant. Where we were stirring, now we've become sluggish. Where we were shifting, now we've become static. Where we were streaming, now we have become slow. Paul encourages Timothy that even when times get tough and things start to change, that his gratefulness will keep him going. And he motivates him by remembering that he was not qualified, because, but because of his faith in Jesus. Jesus didn't qualify, didn't call the qualified. He qualifies the call, but his gullibility kept him going. Can I give you one more? Verse 14, it says, And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. His exceeding abundant grace will keep you going. Not only is it the gratefulness, not only is it the gullibility, but it's his grace. That keeps us going. Oh, if this doesn't motivate you and move you, then nothing else will. His grace had to be exceeding and abundant because your sins were exceeding and abundant. Paul comes clean and admits it. I was a blasphemer. I was a persecutor. I was an insolent man. An insolent man means that he took pleasure in persecuting Christians. He enjoyed it, but grace saved him. Anyway, some folk won't admit that they were sinners, but you have to be able to admit that I was wrong. I was a sinner so that you know that you need a savior. Your sins keep you coming back, recognizing that you need a savior. See, some folks think that they're so good, but listen, you need a savior. But first you have to admit that you are lost in sin. Grace will keep you going when you don't want to keep going. Grace will remind you that you didn't even deserve to be here. Grace will remind you that Jesus paid your debt in full on an old rugged cross that you could not have paid, but he paid it anyway. Grace will motivate you to say, in spite of it all, oh, I must serve him. I didn't deserve it. But I'm grateful for the gift of grace. I didn't know how bad I really was, but I'm grateful for the gift of grace. Grace 
is what keeps me pushing when I don't want to push. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. You ought to point to yourself, put your hand on your chest and just say, amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost. Can anybody else testify that you were lost? I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. It was grace that motivates me to push on and see what the end is going to be. What is going to keep you near the cross? Grace. What will carry us through COVID-19? Grace. What will keep you running on to see what the end is going to be? Grace. What can lift you up when you're feeling down? It's grace. What will get you up and out of bed and moving in the morning? It's grace. What will push you to be your best in the name of Jesus? It's his grace. For it was grace that carried me this far. And grace will carry me home. Can we just celebrate that on today? Wasn't it grace that keeps you going? Wasn't it grace that got you out of bed? Wasn't it grace that woke you up and said, he woke me up this morning? It was nothing but grace. It was nobody but Jesus Christ that gave you the grace. It was his gift that he gave us on the cross that set us free. It's the grace that's going to motivate us to continue on right now as we look forward and don't know what the future is going to be. It's grace that's going to keep us focused on the name of Jesus and the fact that there are still people who don't know him as their Lord and Savior and partner of their sins. It's grace that motivates us. And when we look back over our lives and we think about Everything that we've sinned, it's grace that reminds us that we were once gullible. That we thought that we were doing it right until we were introduced to a man named Jesus who saved us from our gullibility. It's our gratitude and our thankfulness that's going to push us through the toughest of times. That's going to motivate us to just not sit around and wait and see when we get back in church, it's grace. It's our gratefulness. It's thanking God that we are not gullible anymore. That's going to motivate us. And right now, if you're at home, in your car, wherever you may be, in your kitchen, your bedroom, wherever you are, I'm here to let you know that right now you don't have to be gullible anymore. You can look back over your life and say, hey, I've been doing just fine, Pastor. I don't know exactly what you're talking about, but I'm doing good. I'm not a blasphemer. I'm not a persecutor. I'm not an insolent man like Paul was. But I dare you and I challenge you to go and look at those Ten Commandments in the book of Exodus, chapter 20. Go down all ten of them and ask yourself, have I violated any of these Ten Commandments? Have I loved my neighbor as myself? Have I loved the Lord God with all of my heart, all of my mind, and all of my soul? If you have not done that, then you need a Savior. Because the Bible says that you have sinned and you are lost. We are born into sin. So you need a Savior. So right now, leave us a comment on our page. Leave us a comment in the chat. Don't be afraid right now. Just accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and your personal Savior. Jesus Christ paid it all on the cross. And the pay was pretty good. It was good because he took all of our sins that we did not, that we had committed, but he did not deserve to take all. Because he had no sin. And he paid the price for us on that cross so that you might have access to eternal life, to God our Father, to the kingdom of heaven. Right now, accept him right now, right where you are. And right now, if you have 
not committed to a church home, if you don't have a pastor, if you don't have a place to call your, your very own, right now we invite you to join the Mount Gilead Baptist Church family. You can join us online and be a, a member no matter where you are. All we're trying to do is to introduce a little bit of Christ into your life. Give us a comment, comment on our page, and let us know. Leave us, a, leave us a message and let us know so that we can get you off to the right track with a life and a career in the name of Jesus Christ. Won't you just thank God with me on today? Let us pray. Father in heaven, we come to you right now. Lord, thanking you for the motivation to just push on, God. We thank you, God, because we recognize and realize that life in church will never be the same again as we knew it. Lord, sometimes we can get comfortable and we can get in our ways and get in our own way. And we can just forget, God, that your presence is with us everywhere that we go. We're not restricted to bricks and drywall and wood and instruments and all those things, Lord. I will bless the Lord at all times and your praise shall continually be in my mouth. No matter if I'm in my home, your praise shall continually be in my mouth. No matter if I'm out on the street, your praise shall continually be in my mouth. Lord, I just want to stay committed to the cause. 